God gave us. We have all sorts of information and all sorts of instructions and things that are given to us. So one of the things about this book is that over 25% of it, over one quarter of the pages in this book are devoted to the subject of Bible prophecy. Now, God tells us all sorts of things. He introduces himself to us in the beginning of the Bible. He uh, tells us that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So we're introduced to God, who is God, who is the Creator. We're introduced to man. God said, let's make man in our image, after our likeness. And so God uh, formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, molded him in his own shape and image, placed him in a garden, and then from the man took a rib and made a woman and presented her uh, there to Adam. God made our first parents. God reveals in the Scriptures about Himself. He reveals about mankind. Uh, what is man? Uh, what is the destiny of man? What is the purpose of man? He reveals a plan and a purpose for life. He reveals all sorts of things. He reveals the way of life. He reveals the way to interact with our, uh, with our neighbors, with our uh, family members, with, with any aspect, anything you want to think about. There are parts of the Bible that are, that are prepared if you're at a, maybe a difficult time, a low time. We all go through times that are, uh, that are hard, that are overwhelming, that are sad, that, that the whole gamut of human emotions. You know, there's sections in the Bible that are specifically written for those things for those times. And as you go through and as you read, you find illustrations, you find examples, uh, you find maybe sections in the Psalms that, uh, that are there to, to uh, give you food to think about, to meditate on. Uh, things that you may, uh, verses that you may just emotionally connect with as you go reading through because of, of things that you're experiencing at that moment in time. There are other sections of the Bible that maybe deal with very practical information. The book of Proverbs is just loaded with advice in terms of how to interact, how to function in life, how to uh, uh, be wise and perceptive and how to handle your affairs. Uh, the gospel account, the life and the message and the teaching of Jesus Christ, of what he said and did, uh, God's whole plan and purpose, it's all laid out in the Bible. God gives us a book uh, that contains the words of life. And we're told that every word, that all Scripture, is by inspiration of God. It is God-breathed. But out of this book, God spends at least one quarter, and, and you know, you see various estimates. Some will say one-third or 30 percent or 25 percent. I think we can very safely say in excess of 25 percent of this book is devoted to the subject of Bible prophecy, the overwhelming uh, majority of which is yet to be fulfilled. The majority, the overwhelming majority of which is for the future. Now, there are many sections, many parts of Bible prophecies that have been fulfilled. But have you ever stopped and asked yourself the question, why does God spend so much of the Bible on the subject of prophecy? Now, whether it's 25% or, or 30% or the exact percentage uh, really doesn't matter that much. I guess it's a matter of the way you want to count it. You know, we think of certain books as being almost exclusive prophetic. The book of Revelation, of course, comes to mind. That's uh, prophetic. Uh, but you go through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Uh, you go through Daniel. You go through the Twelve Minor Prophets. Uh, and, and books that are overwhelmingly prophetic. But then you go back through the Psalms, and the Psalms contains many prophecies in the Psalms, particularly prophecies of the Messiah, both of His first coming and His second coming, prophecies of, of the world to come. You can go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And, and the book of Genesis opens, and we have prophecy contained right there. Uh, in, in the uh, book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3 tells about how the seed of woman will triumph over the serpent. Uh, that is the beginning of God revealing his whole plan of salvation. And you go all the way through the Bible, and I don't know, I guess somebody sat down and tried to count out verses and decide, you know, well, this one's prophetic, and they've come up with various percentages, but anyway, you want to slice it, a very large percentage, certainly a quarter or more of the Bible, is uh, prophecy. Why does God spend so much time in this book giving us prophetic revelation? Well, let me call your attention to two particular aspects of why uh, he does that, and then let's go on to, to, to notice some things that are, that are very important. The, uh, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, Verse 1, it says, Bel bows down, Nebo stoops. Their idols were upon the beasts and upon the cattle. Your carriages were heavy laden. They are a burden to the weary beast. They stoop, they bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but themselves are gone into captivity. It describes here 
the picture that Isaiah is painting is Babylon and the, uh, the, the idols that the people worshipped uh, being taken into captivity. And talks about you've got these carts uh, hooked up to these oxen. And these carts are loaded down with idols of, of metal and idols of stone. And they're a heavy burden. And the old ox is just barely able to put one foot in front of the other. And he's hauling them off. They're a part of the... Uh, uh, they're a part... Uh, of what has been of the booty, the war booty that has been taken into captivity. They are a burden uh, to the weary beast. They could not deliver the burden, but they themselves are gone into captivity. So God paints a picture of, Id- uh, of idols. And he says, you know, these idols couldn't even protect themselves. Uh, they're just a heavy load. You know, they've got this whole cart loaded up. And this whole ox is just barely pulling the hill, uh, carrying all these uh, heavy statues and things like that. So God... In painting that picture, and then he goes on to uh, say in verse 5, To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? They lavish gold out of the bag. They weigh silver in the balance. They hire a goldsmith and make it a, make it a god. They fall down. Yes, they worship. They bear him upon the shoulder. They carry him. They set him in his place. He stands up. From his place shall he not remove. Yes, one shall cry unto him. He can't deliver. He can't save out of his trouble. You know, again, Isaiah describes this, how ridiculous it is. They go and they take their gold and they take their silver and they take these things to a craftsman and he makes an idol, makes this little statue, and they set it up, they fix it just right, put it in the spot, and then they start bowing down to it and praying to it and crying out to it. God says, isn't that ridiculous? Remember the former things, verse 9. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executes my counsel from a far country. Yes, I have spoken it, and I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. You see... One of the things, first and foremost, that prophecy serves to illustrate is prophecy shows and declares the sovereignty of God. God says, I'm God. There's none like me. I declare the end from the beginning. I announce what is going to be, and it occurs. My counsel shall stand. I'll do all my pleasure. I will do what I purpose. And so God lays out the future. He describes, through many of the Old Testament prophecies, he describes cities that were great, mighty, powerful cities that dominated huge areas for hundreds of years. And God, through the pen of the prophet, said, this city is going to be destroyed. This city is going to be wiped out. This city will cease to exist. It will be a barren spot. Other places are described, places in some cases that maybe were, were obscure, and yet... Those places are going to endure. Those places are going to remain. Those places you can come back to right now. You know, here was a place like Tyre, ancient Tyre, great, huge commercial uh, powerhouse. Ancient Tyre, the place, you know, Hiram of Tyre, King David's friend. He uh, provided King Solomon many of the workmen that he needed in building the temple. And not only that, uh, but Tyre was a great uh, uh, shipping and commercial uh, area. It, it was famous for that, for the Phoenician sailors. Solomon recruited Phoenician sailors and uh, worked with Hiram of Tyre in building this great navy that sailed, uh, that had two ports. One uh, port of Tarshish, uh, which was there actually on the uh, south, uh, on, the, on the coast of Spain. And uh, then uh, Elot, which was right there at the northern tip of the uh, Red Sea, the, the, extent, the, the Gulf of Aqaba, which is a northern extension of the Red Sea, uh, the, the, it's where the modern Israeli naval port of Elat is, and so Solomon's ancient port. And it describes, you, you know, we've gone through some of those things, and, and uh, describes the, the, all these sailors, and they sailed, and they went places, and you read uh, even in references in the Old Testament to uh, Tyre and its trading and commerce. It was a great and mighty place, and yet uh, the Old Testament prophets uh, go through and describe the future. Ezekiel described what was going to happen to Tyre and how it was going to be scraped like a rock. 
And you know, over 200 years after Ezekiel wrote those words, uh, Alexander the Great came in and did just that. He he destroyed the city of Tyre, and it's, it's nothing. It's a place where the fishermen spread their nets now. And yet it was the greatest uh, uh, commercial shipping uh, center uh, there on the Mediterranean for hundreds of years. A mighty place. God declares the end from the beginning. And here's a little spot. You know, who Jerusalem, if, if you were just a worldly observer uh, back, uh, uh, you know, a thousand years, uh, uh, let's say 3,000 years ago, or 2,500 years ago, if you were just a worldly observer looking at the various cities and places around, if you, uh, let's say, go back 1,600 years ago, that would put you back to about 600 B.C. You would see the city of Babylon, a city that had been a mighty city by that time for, well, ever since Nimrod built it, it had been a mighty city for over 1,500 years by that time, by 600 B.C. It was the capital of Nebuchadnezzar's empire. So here was this vast empire, this mighty city that had been a part of things ever since the, you know, the first city built after the flood. Here was this great and mighty city that was the capital of a great empire that was in the process of spreading and expanding. And then you would have looked at what would have been classified as this little backwater town of Jerusalem. Oh, it was very important to the Jews. But, you know, the Jews were just one people among dozens of people all over the Middle East. And if you were just looking at it as a worldly observer, you'd see this little city over here, Nebuchadnezzar's already taken it. It's already a part of his empire. They're having to pay taxes and tribute to it, uh, to him, to Babylon. And the king there in Jerusalem is the man that Nebuchadnezzar appointed king. Now, you look at this, and you look at one that is the capital of great empire, and you look at another uh, that is a small town by comparison and is a part... <clears throat> is a part of Nebuchadnezzar's empire, already having to pay taxes. Uh, the, the king reigns by Nebuchadnezzar's pleasure. And somebody were to point that out to you, and you look at the world scene and say, now, I want you to guess 2,600 years into the future. And I want you to tell me which one of these cities will still, one of these cities will still be existing. And it will be playing a major strategic part in events. In, in world politics 2,600 years from now. One of these cities will have been destroyed and there won't be anything left. There'll be a few archaeological excavations around there where they sort of dug uh, part of the ruins out and people can come and look at it. One of these will be a vibrant city that will be playing a major part on the world scene and the other will simply have, have ceased for centuries to even be inhabited. Which one of these cities do you think will last, and which one do you think will be wiped out? Well, you know, if all you had as a worldly observer was just to look at things, uh, you know, it would be sort of like looking and saying, well, uh, you know, which, which place do you think is going to last and play a major part a thousand years from now, New York City or Longview? Uh, well, you know, that's uh, maybe from around here we'd sort of be prejudiced, and we'd say, well, maybe Longview. But, uh, uh, you know, most people wouldn't, wouldn't view it that way. The point is, God... Declares, he says, my counsel shall stand. You see, prophecy is a proof, is an evidence of the sovereignty of God, that God is God, and he can bring about what he chooses, including things that seem most improbable. Things that no one would likely guess. On the other hand, you see, God can accomplish and choose, uh, God chooses to, to do various things. He has a plan and a purpose he's working out. And prophecy attests to the sovereignty of God. And in Isaiah 46, the sovereignty and the power of God is contrasted with the, weak, with the weakness, the helplessness, uh, the utter insignificance of idols, of false gods. So that's certainly one aspect of prophecy, and God includes prophecy throughout the Bible to demonstrate to us his sovereignty to remind us as to who it is that determines the course of future events. Now, in addition to that, prophecy also, as well as attesting to the sovereignty of God, prophecy also serves to give hope to the people of God in times of difficulty and distress and adversity. You know, we live in Satan's world. We're surrounded by things, sometimes things in our own personal life, maybe, maybe problems and trials and difficulties we're going through. 
maybe job problems, maybe financial problems, maybe family difficulties, it may be any number of things. We're sometimes surrounded, and it seems like everything is just coming in on top of us. In addition, you just look around at the world. You look around at the trend of, of secular society. You see the, uh, the attitudes that are so prevalent. You see the problems and the, and the troubles that are going on around the world. And, you, you know, if you watch very much news or read about events, you look at whole sections of the world that are just undergoing horrible situations horrible circumstances. You look at whole, you know, people, tens of thousands of people just uprooted, refugees, uh, on the move, trying to get out away from where somebody is shooting, bombing. You look at all of these situations and you look at what's happening even in our own country. You look at the trend and the direction of things. You know, if all you had to look at was what you see around you, if the best hope you had was maybe we can get old so-and-so elected. Oh, if he can get in there, you know, he'll straighten it all out. Well, I hate to disillusion you, but, uh, you know, everybody when, when they run for election, they, they, they all say, if my opponent gets in there, he's going to wreck the whole place, but you get me in there and I'll fix it. And yet, somehow it all doesn't get fixed, does it? See, if the only hope you had was based on present trends, was based on getting this fellow or that fellow elected, you wouldn't have much hope. Prophecy holds out hope to the people of God. As Mr. Armstrong used to put it, you know, I read the end of the book, and we win. You know, that's right. We win. But, you know, let's go back to the time of, of the prophet Isaiah, for instance. Isaiah was writing when the Assyrian Empire was dominant on the world scene. The Assyrian Empire had spread in a sweep across much of the Middle East. Uh, it had expanded into what is today modern-day uh, Turkey. Uh, it had expanded all the way down into northern Israel, had, had captured Samaria, and taken the northern ten tribes into captivity. It was in the process of deporting them. It had already, at the time Isaiah was writing, had deported tens upon tens of thousands uh, of Israelites from the, nor from the northern ten tribes. It the Assyrian Empire, in addition to that, they didn't just stop at the border. They kept moving. They came on in. They took, uh, they captured the cities, the northern cities of Judah. They also came on up to the point of even laying siege against Jerusalem for a period of time during the reign of King Hezekiah. Assyria was a dominant empire on the world scene. It had been around for a long time. And was it, 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 was, it was a very threatening, very threatening empire to the people of the Middle East, to the, even the people of, Ju of Judah. Isaiah, writing in the book of Isaiah, looks on beyond his day and his time, and he talks about a time when the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. He talks about a time when uh, Mount Zion will be established above all the mountains, and when all nations will come up to the God of Jacob and say, let him teach us of his ways. Now, that wasn't happening in Isaiah's day. In fact, King Hezekiah, after uh, the Assyrians were deporting Israelites from northern Israel. Hezekiah, you remember, uh, held his great Passover. He sent out emissaries all up through northern, uh, the northern part of, of uh, in the first year of his reign. He sent emissaries up through northern Israel, and he proclaimed to the people to come and to worship God in Jerusalem and to celebrate the Passover. And most of them mocked him and laughed, him, laughed his emissaries to scorn. That was the reality of the world in Isaiah's day. You know, if you were looking around at that time, it didn't look like anybody wanted to obey God or not very many people. And yet Isaiah looked forward to a time when nations all over, not just northern Israel that was laughing to scorn even as they were being deported, but nations all over would come and say, let's go up to the God of Jacob where the law of God would go forth out of Jerusalem. Isaiah talked of a time when Assyria would no longer be a great and mighty power. In fact, the power that took Assyria's place, Babylon. Isaiah described the defeat and destruction of Babylon. In the days of Jeremiah the prophet, writing over a hundred years after Isaiah, in the days of Jeremiah, the Babylonians had come to Jerusalem. They had deported uh, in three different, in three successive invasions over about a 20-year period, or, uh, yeah, about uh, a little less than 20 years. Uh, maybe about 17 or 18 years, uh, they, in three successive invasions, three successive waves, deported tens of thousands of Jews. 
in the last of these invasions, they destroy Jerusalem. They burn the temple. They just raise the whole thing to the ground. It was a pretty desolate, hopeless-looking situation. And yet, Jeremiah wrote, and he talked about the fact that uh, uh, there would be a period of time that would, uh, uh, that would go by, and then God would bring the Jews back out of Babylon. If you go to Isaiah or to Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29, verse 1. Now these are the words of the latter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem under the residue of the elders that were carried away captive, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. And uh, down in verse 4, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. He said, Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens, eat the fruit. Take wives, have children. Verse uh, 10, For thus says the Lord, After seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return from this place. Now, Years later, in fact, uh, in Daniel chapter 9, we read that the first year after Babylon fell, Babylon, you, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's first invasion of Jerusalem and of Judea was in 604 B.C. He uh, had fought a battle north of there uh, at Carchemish up on the Euphrates River in 605 and came on down uh, to Jerusalem, uh, made Judea or Judah a tributary state, uh, put a new king on the throne, one that he thought would do what he told him to do, uh, made him pay tribute. He took away some of the young princes and some of the uh, ones that this would probably, this would include da uh, Daniel, and uh, brought them to Babylon. This was in 604. Daniel was a young man, maybe 14, 15 years of age. Sixty-five years pass. Daniel has grown to adulthood. Uh, now he is getting on up in years. He's about 80 years of age. Babylon, the great city that, uh, uh, over which Nebuchadnezzar ruled, the capital of this great empire, Babylon fell. That's described in the book of Daniel. You know, you remember the night of the handwriting on the wall, and the Medes and the Persians came in. And now Babylon has fallen, and Darius the Mede is set up uh, as the regent there in Babylon. King Cyrus has gone elsewhere. And Daniel now has been about 65 years since he left Jerusalem as a young boy. He's a teenager. And he has seen all of these things that have gone by. Now, Daniel 9, verse 2, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood my books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Daniel was here studying the book of, Jer uh, the, the book of Jeremiah and trying to understand what this prophecy meant. And as he looked back and, and as was, he was thinking about it, it seemed like that certainly if it was figured from the original invasion of Jerusalem, that 70 years must be drawing to a close. Babylon had fallen. The Medes and the Persians had taken over. Daniel was seeking to understand, and he was studying and praying and fasting, as it described here in verse 3. You see, God gave prophecy to encourage and to build and strengthen the faith of his people. In times of difficulty, in times of adversity, uh, there we can go through and understand what is going to unfold. And we have an assurance that what we're living in the midst of is not the permanent order of things. What's going to be the outcome of events in Europe or the Middle East or right here in this country? It's not a matter of just sort of flipping a coin and, well, one guess is as good as another. No, you see, God has declared the end from the beginning, so not only does he declare his sovereignty that he is God and he brings to pass what he chooses, but he also offers encouragement to the people of God because he is working out a plan and a purpose. Daniel was going through and studying that and trying to understand because this particular prophecy related very directly to Daniel. And God now revealed even more to Daniel. Because remember, at the time Daniel 9 is written, the city of Jerusalem has been desolate. 
for decades. It's been empty. It's been a burned, uh, destroyed uh, place. The temple is gone. And yet, as Daniel is here praying, an angel appeared and began to tell Daniel that, as it says in verse 24 of Daniel 9, 70 sevens are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. Now, it's translated into the King James 70 weeks. It's actually a slightly different Hebrew word uh, than the word week, and, and most literally would be translated sevens, because in reality it's talking about 70 periods of seven years, or 490 years. Daniel is given a vision here that relates uh, to events of the future on beyond his time, events that will start in their reckoning from the going forth of a commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. Well, that decree hadn't been issued yet. Daniel was seeking to, to know when the people would be allowed to go back, when these 70 years Jeremiah talked about were going to be over. Now God revealed to him, you know, there is going to be a period of 70 sevens from the time that the decree to rebuild Jerusalem goes out until the Messiah, the Prince, will come. And he goes through and explains this. You see, God laid out the future from the beginning. Now, we live in a world where we're surrounded by things, and we look at a, at a very unstable and unsteady and troubled world in which we live. Think back to the first century. Think back to the time of, of the people who, you know, in the immediate aftermath of, of Christ's resurrection and ascension into heaven, there was a time of great excitement, great growth. There were tremendous miracles. There were all sorts of astounding events uh, that took place. And yet, within a matter of a few years, as you go through the book of Acts, uh, things went along and just seemed like everything was just mushrooming. And after a couple of years, one of the most prominent, most outstanding, most deeply loved and respected men in the Jerusalem church was taken out by the religious leadership and murdered. His name was Stephen. He was a deacon serving in the Jerusalem church. He was a man deeply loved and respected. He was grabbed up, given a quick trial, hauled out to the edge of the city, and people threw rocks at him, and he died. And the effect on the Jerusalem church was immediate. Within a very short time, people spread out, people left, and uh, they were getting out of Jerusalem. Nobody wanted to be next in line. The apostles remained there for a period of time. You go on through the book of Acts and you find that troubles and difficulties began to come. The church continued to grow. It spread outside the confines of Judea and Samaria and Galilee. You go on through the ministry of the apostle Paul. But by the late 60s A.D., most of the apostles who were themselves, you see, probably in their 60s, most of them were let's say approximately the age of Jesus Christ within a few years one way or the other. So by the 60s A.D., they were men who were getting on up into their 60s, but uh, uh, they weren't dying natural deaths. Uh, they were being executed. They were being hunted down. Uh, finally, uh, by the uh, late 60s A.D., between 65 and 68 A.D., or between 64 and 68, uh, the three, mo three of the most prominent men in the New Testament church were murdered. James, the very brother of Jesus Christ, was actually thrown off of a, uh, a pinnacle, a wall there of the temple in Jerusalem, was actually, uh, was actually shoved off uh, onto a rocky uh, valley down below to dash his brains out, to, to kill him, a horrible death. And then by 67 A.D., Paul was in prison in Rome, was executed, Tradition says he was beheaded, but he was. you can read in Second Timothy, he knew that he was shortly to be executed. Within a matter of a few months, Peter was also executed there. And so by the end of 68 A.D., the Emperor Nero, who had launched a tremendous persecution, was responsible for the deaths of Peter and Paul. Uh, John had, or James had been slaughtered by, uh, by Jewish religious leaders in Jerusalem about, two, about uh, three years earlier uh, than the other two. 
The Jerusalem church fled Jerusalem. That had been the headquarters church to which people had looked. Uh, men like James and Peter and Paul were gone. And by 70 A.D., Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Virtually the entire uh, original generation of leadership of the New Testament church was gone. There were all sorts of heresies going on that were ripping apart whole congregations. You know, Jude had written in the 60s, uh, back just prior to all of this sort of exploding, uh, Jude uh, had written in the mid-60s about you need to earnestly contend for the faith once and for all delivered. And he talked about false teachers who had crept in. If you were an observer in the New Testament church, maybe someone who had grown up in the church there in, uh, in Judea, uh, maybe having been born, maybe you were a little child uh, during the time of the, uh, um, the events of the day of Pentecost, maybe a little, a little child about five or six years old. Old enough, certainly, to have been vividly impressed by seeing uh, certain miracles. Maybe your parents were there and part of those initial converts, and you saw uh, these tremendous miracles, and you saw some of these things as you were coming on up seven, eight, nine, ten years old. And as you grew on up to adulthood, and all of these other things, though, began to happen. By 70 A.D., you see, someone of that age uh, would have been getting on up, uh, let's say, in their mid-40s. And uh, they would have, by 70 A.D., having seen things take and twists and turns that uh, uh, were just unimaginable. All of the top leadership, the men you'd grown up looking up to, virtually all of them were dead. Within just a matter of a few years, persecution had taken place. Uh, there, were, uh, there were all sorts of things going on. Now we come on up to 90 A.D. That's when uh, we pick up the story here with the Apostle John. You know, if you'd been a, a young uh, boy uh, there at the events of the day of Pentecost described in Acts 2, you would be, by this point in time, uh, getting on up in your late 60s, maybe up uh, approaching 70 years of age. And it would seem that everything was getting worse and worse. Whole congregations had totally turned aside from the truth. You know, the Apostle John writes in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he talks about uh, the situation was such that, that individuals like Diotrephes were gaining control of local congregations and putting true Christians out of the church. You remember? So here you are on the scene. You're observing these things. You're seeing these things. It's like everything is so topsy-turvy, and you're trying to make sense of it. There's only one of the original group of leadership left, and that's the Apostle John. The Apostle John is on up in his 90s. And he has been arrested by order of the Emperor Domitian and exiled to the island of Patmos, a little island, a little rocky uh, prison island that was off the coast uh, of Asia Minor. And he spent several years there on this island. And in the course of the time that he is there, he writes several books one of which is the book of Revelation. Most likely the last book that John wrote, it certainly is the culmination of, of the New Testament, the culmination of the Bible. John was in exile on the island of Patmos at the time he wrote this. This would have been in the, in the mid-90s uh, A.D. John uh, describes his situation when he says uh, uh, that... Uh, uh, he was uh, in exile. He was, on, he was there uh, on the island of Patmos, and uh, he was in exile because of the word of God. He describes it in verse 9 of John 1, or Revelation 1. I, John, who also am your brother, am companion in tribulation. And in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was there because of his loyalty to the word, to God's truth, to God's word, to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, the Old Testament and the New Testament. John was in exile there. He said, I'm your companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. You see, looking at the world from the perspective of someone who has seen the events of much of the first century, who has seen things take twists and turns that they never imagined in 30, 31, 32, 33 A.D. John now provides 
the capstone of the Bible, in which he takes and is the instrument through whom God reveals the way everything is going to come out. Because, you see, as a person standing there at that time, and there were members of the congregation, there were people undoubtedly in their 60s and 70s, people who looked back and who, whose life spanned much of the first century, who had seen firsthand the events of which you and I can only read in the book of Acts. But you know there were people who lived through those events, just as there are those of us here who have lived through events of the last uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 years and more who have seen the things that have happened in this country, who have seen things that have happened all over. You see, you've experienced it. You've gone through it. There were people there who had gone through these things. And you know, they had to be perplexed. They had to feel somehow what in the world is happening and how is it all going to work out. Because if you were basing your life on what you could see, it seemed like the good guys were losing and the bad guys were winning. If you were going to base your life on what you could see, you wouldn't have much hope. The Roman Empire looked, fir looked more firmly in Scots than ever. The church looked like everything was falling apart. And John now writes a letter. It is a letter that is addressed in Revelation 1-4 to the seven churches which are in Asia written here to churches there in the area of Asia Minor. Seven specific congregations are picked out, uh, congregations that are on a Roman meal route. And John is chosen here because, you see, he's been kept alive way beyond the others. He is by now well into his 90s. God had a special job in mind for John. Because after all of these things have happened, the time of great growth, the time of the writing of most of the New Testament, the time of the events that we read of in the book of Acts and in Paul's epistles, those times had passed. And now there is another phase. God had kept John, one of the original twelve alive, to put together the final form of the New Testament to be transmitted down through time, through generations, preserving the witness of Christ's testimony. So that you and I might hold that book in our laps and we might read it and study it and understand. John was the one who was used here to, to, to do this. Then kept alive to make sense of the world after Jerusalem had fallen in 70 A.D., after the other apostles had died and the church was rent with all sorts of problems. Revelation 1, one, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So the revelation originated with the Father. The Father reserved the times and the seasons into his own power. You remember the last thing the disciples asked Jesus as he was preparing to rise up to heaven from the Mount of Olives. They said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has reserved to his own power. You see, God has a plan, and you don't need to know all those details right now. You just need to go back to Jerusalem, wait until you're imbued with power from on high, and then go out and do what I told you to do. So they did. The Apostle Paul it was recorded in the book of Acts when he was speaking there in Athens uh, on Mars Hill. He talked about how God has determined the times before appointed of all the, the rise and fall of empires. He's determined the times before appointed. He's set the bounds of their habitation. God has had a plan and a purpose. Now we find that God has unveiled information never before revealed. It is the revelation, the unveiling made by Jesus Christ, given to him by the Father, for the purpose of showing the servants of God the things that are shortly going to happen. And the events recorded here start in the 90s and proceed on down, on out, well over a thousand years into our future. It is a sequence of events. It was sent to John by an angel. John, in this book, verse 2, bears record of three things. The Word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, and all the things that he saw. The Word of God is a reference to the Old Testament, as we term it. 
You know, you go back through the Old Testament prophets and, and over and over they, they use the phrase, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah saying, the word of the Lord came unto, uh, you know, so and so saying, the word of the Lord came to. This term, the word of the Lord. Now, John bore record of the word of the Lord. Because you see, scattered throughout the Old Testament are prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. But let's just take one example. What about Ezekiel 37? Ezekiel 37, you remember, that's the, the, the prophecy about the dry bones. Ezekiel sees a vision, sees a valley full of dry bones. And he's told, you know, these dry bones are going to live. And the bones come together, bones, flesh comes upon the bones, and you've got a whole valley full of corpses. And then breath comes into them, and they're alive, and they stand up. And Ezekiel is told, son of man, this represents the whole house of Israel. And they say, our hope is lost, our, you know, we're, we're gone, we have no hope. But I'm going to raise them up, and I'm going to bring them into the land, and I'm going to, to put my spirit within them, and they're going to know that I'm God. Ezekiel 37 describes a great resurrection, a restoring to life, and an opportunity that people are going to have to know that the true God is God. But what if all you had was the book of Ezekiel? You read Ezekiel 37. You read the whole book of Ezekiel. You can understand from Ezekiel 37 that there's going to be a restoring of life. But when is it going to happen? What's the sequence? What's going to happen before and what's going to happen after? You don't know. It doesn't tell you in Ezekiel. It just describes in, in somewhat uh, colorful detail this resurrection. But when you get to Revelation chapter 20, you read about a resurrection to immortality, to glory. And you're told in Revelation 20 that blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. They'll be priests of God and of Christ, and they'll reign for a thousand years. So you read about that first glorious resurrection called in Revelation 20, the first resurrection. Then you read that the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Then you read that all of the dead, small and great, stood before God. They are restored to life. Only when you get to Revelation 20 can you understand how to fit Ezekiel 37 into a time frame. Because Ezekiel doesn't give you the time frame. He just describes an event. Now, you could go through many, many uh, instances. That's just one. You see, John bore record of the Word of God. The book of Revelation contains over 600 allusions to the Old Testament. 600 quotes or paraphrases. Most of them are paraphrases. Sort of interesting. Some of the commentators say different things. One of them said 644. I don't know who went through and counted, and, and I'm not going to guarantee you it's 644, but uh, I think it's safe to say it's, it's well over 600. You can just go down in most Bibles, if they have a center reference column, you can just go down and look in the center reference column, and you'll find many, many Old Testament references uh, there in the book of Revelation, where when you go back and you look in the Old Testament, you'll see uh, a verse or a part of a verse either directly quoted or paraphrased, maybe a section uh, that is referenced. The point is, John, and by comparison, uh, Paul in his epistles used maybe 250 uh, quotations out of the Old Testament. Uh, John, the book of Revelation, used over 600. So the book of Revelation is filled with allusions to Old Testament prophecies. John bore record of the Word of God. He, he wove it together. He also bore record of the testimony of Jesus Christ. What Jesus Christ said was his testimony. Jesus Christ came... The testimony of Jesus Christ can, in some cases, refer to the whole gospel of the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ came as the messenger of the new covenant. And so he explained about the kingdom of God and how we can be part of that kingdom, how we can be born into that kingdom, how we can enter that kingdom. Jesus Christ answered questions about what would be the sign of his coming and of the end of the age. Jesus Christ gave testimony. John bore record of that testimony. Some of that testimony is directly included in the book of Revelation, and other parts of Revelation refer to and explain things that Jesus said, because Jesus himself is the revelator. And so when it comes to prophecy, you start back with Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Christ's response to the question of what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age that's testimony that John himself stood there and personally heard Jesus give on the Mount of Olives, just a matter of days before Jesus was crucified. So John heard that testimony, 
And that outline is utilized right here. John bore record of the Word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, and things that he saw. You know, you and I can read the book, but John's on movie. He actually saw it. He was transported in vision into the day of the Lord. Saw astounding things. And then he had to write about it and describe it. You know, if you saw something that you'd never seen before, saw some tremendous... Uh, you know, weapon or, or means of conveyance, some, some tremendous thing, some sort of futuristic. What would you call it? Well, you would liken it to what you have, something you had seen. You know, people described years ago when the first automobiles came out, they, they called it a horseless carriage. Well, they were trying to describe it, you know, they didn't know what to call it, but it looked sort of like, like a carriage but didn't have a horse. You know, science fiction came along, and they drew pictures of what they called flying saucers. Well, that's sort of the way they drew it. It's sort of like a saucer, so they called it a flying saucer. Well, you, you go through in the book of Revelation, John saw visions of the future, and he had to record them in his own language. So he, he bore record of the Word of God, the testimony of Jesus, and the things that he saw. Now, in verse 4, he begins, the, the, the first three verses are a preface to the book, and in verse 4... And he begins uh, the letter itself, addressed to the seven churches, Grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. Now, just calling your attention there for a moment, coming on down in verse 8, Jesus said, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. When you go back to Exodus chapter 3, Moses revealed himself, or God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush. And Moses said, well, when I go back to Egypt and I tell them the, the God of their fathers sent me down here, they're going to ask me, what's your name? What am I supposed to tell them? You know, Egyptians worship all kinds of gods. i got this God and that God and the other God, and well, I'm going to tell them God sent me. Well, which God? Who, you know, well, what's your name? And God said, I am that I am. You tell them, I am has sent you. Now, if you go back and you do a little study on it, you find that the name of God uh, rendered it in the uh, Old Testament as YHVH, uh, Yahweh, uh, that name comes from, it, it, it comes from the verb to be. The one who is and was and shall be. That's, that's just a conjugation of the verb to be. Past, present, and future. The eternal. The one who always is. So the, the term, the, or, the, the uh, name by which God revealed himself in the Hebrew language is Yahweh, uh, means the one who, who is. The one who was, is, shall be. It is. It comes from a uh, a conjugation of the Hebrew wor uh, of the Hebrew verb to be. Now, the significant thing that people who get all concerned and, and uh, about the uh, the sacred name and, and to them the issue is how do you pronounce it? And there are various factions of groups who who argue as to how to pronounce it. And that's not the point of the sermon to get into that. But I would just call your attention that the significance of the name is the meaning. John was writing in Greek to Greek-speaking people. The churches of Asia Minor were totally Greek-speaking. John wrote to them in Greek. He didn't write the name in Hebrew. He wrote the meaning of the name. He translated it. He wanted to give them a concept that the God that we serve is the God who is and was and is to come. The Eternal. The One who always is. So grace be unto you from him which is and was and is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now that gets into another uh, another uh, case. Did you know there were seven spirits before uh, the throne? They're described uh, as, uh, uh, back in Revelation 4, verse 5, they're described as seven lamps of fire burning. They look like seven lamps of fire, and they're described as, as uh, uh, seven spirits. Uh, back in the book of Zechariah, chapters 3 and 4, uh, they are referred to as the eyes of the Lord. And uh, uh, in uh, Revelation 5 and verse 6, they're described as, as like uh, the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. They're like the seven eyes. You ever wonder how God keeps up with everything, what, where, what 
you know, what's going on everywhere, all the time, at the same time. You ever wonder how, how God uh, keeps up with what's going on everywhere on earth? Well, evidently, he, in some way, we don't fully understand. John looked there, and it looked sort of like, uh, you know, lamps of fire, uh, which it's interesting, you know, back in Revelation, uh, back in Hebrews 1, it talks about he makes his, uh, it may, he makes his angel spirit and his ministers or his servants a flame of fire. So evidently God has some servants here, and they sort of look what John saw, because he's up there and he sees them, look sort of like flames of fire. There's seven of them there. And, and other things go through and describe that they're, in some way, they're, they're sort of like the eyes of the Lord. They, they search out everything, sort of channel everything in. Well, you know, God gives us just enough information to sort of whet our appetite sometimes. He doesn't tell us every... Uh, the things you and I can't understand how it works. I can't even understand how a computer works. I don't know how to push the button and turn it on, but uh, how, how does that little box do all that stuff? Well, uh, if you wait for me to explain it to you, you wait for a long time. Uh, you, you know, it just it sort of happens. You press the button, and there it is. And if you press the button and nothing happens, then you call... Let's get to you or somebody who, who knows what to, you know, what button you need to, to repress. The point is, there are a lot of things you and I, most of us, don't understand. There are things that all of us don't understand. But we, we have a little bit of insight here. So God reveals some things about Himself here, beginning in, in Revelation chapter one. Uh, the, the message comes here from the Father, uh, from Jesus Christ, verse five, faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. Better rendering. Uh, the prince of the kings of the earth, him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And uh, he's the one that's going to come with clouds, verse 7. Every eye will see him, and they also which pierce him. That's a reference, by the way, back in Zechariah 12.10. It talks about they'll look on him, speaking of Jews, uh, they'll look on him whom they pierced. Come to deep repentance. Well, uh, down in verse 8, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is and was and is to come, the Almighty. So God describes Himself. You see, the significance of the name of God is it tells you about God's nature and character. It describes who God is. He is the eternal, the beginning and the ending. He's the one who was there when things started. In the beginning, God. He's the one who is eternal, is and was and is to come. Now, John goes on and writes, describes this vision that he saw of the one that he recognized as the Son of Man. And yet he saw him in glory, with his countenance shining like the sun in its strength. And John is overwhelmed. He's told, verse 19, to write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, he had seen certain symbols of seven stars and seven lampstands, and he's told now what those symbols represent. So, John, it, we're introduced here in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, to a vision where John is sort of sets the stage for the book. This is delivered to him, and he sees the one that he had walked and talked with up and down the dusty roads of Judea and Galilee and Samaria, he sees that one, but he sees him in glory and power in an overwhelming, awesome manner. Then beginning in chapter 2 and 3, there are messages for each of these seven churches, which are direct messages to those congregations, yes, but those seven churches represent the entirety of the church. These seven successive stops on a Roman mail route represent the seven stages through which the church will pass. It represents the entirety of the history of the church. Seven is used throughout the book of Revelation. These messages are given in chapter three, uh, 2 and 3. And then in chapter 4, when this was concluded, chapter 4, verse 1, After this I looked, and behold, the door was opened in heaven. And the voice said, Come up here. Oh, boy, that would be quite an invitation, wouldn't it? Why don't you come on up? Well, boy, I'm ready to do that. Uh... I'll show you the things which must be hereafter. So John, in this trance, in this vision, in, immediately he says, I was in the Spirit. Well, in a trance, in, in, in a vision, and he was here in this vision. He was transported, and he was there, and he saw these things. And he saw the very throne of God. And he saw all of these things that are described right here uh, in chapter 4. And in chapter 5, he saw the one sitting on the throne had a book in his right hand. And it was written 
on both sides, written on the back side, uh, written, you know, on both sides. It was parchment, a scroll, uh, written uh, within and on the back side, and it was sealed with seven seals. Now, a seal was used. The purpose of a seal, of course, is to authenticate the genuineness of something. Kings, when they were sending official documents, would seal those documents. You know, scrolls roll shut, and then what they would do is, is pour some hot wax, uh, melt some hot wax there, sort of a blob on the uh, uh, where the, the scroll came together. And the king, while the wax was still warm, would press his signet ring into that warm wax, and it made the exact impress of, of his seal. Now, there was only, you know, his ring was, was unique. It was the king's royal signet, his royal seal. Well, nobody, anyone who opened that scroll prior, other than the, than the authorized individual, it would be very apparent because you could break the wax. That's not hard to break. But you couldn't seal it back. Oh, you could melt the wax and sort of put it back, but you couldn't make the seal impress. If you broke the seal, it would be apparent. See, that way a king could give the scrolls to a messenger and say, take it to this governor or this general way over here. And they knew, you see, if the scroll arrived with the seal broken, it was the death penalty to the messenger. So you sort of lost your incentive to be a snoop. Uh, you, you, you wanted to make sure, you know, the thing didn't, didn't crack, it didn't break. You took very good care of it. The king didn't want just everybody reading what he had written. It was only accessible to the one to whom it was addressed, the one who was authorized. There was someone who was authorized to break the king's seal. And then he could open the book and read it. Now, here is seven seals. The book is sealed, unrolled in little ways, and then you have to break another seal. In this case, who is found worthy to break the seal? Well, nobody around, none of the angels, nobody on earth, nobody that had died and was in the grave. But there was one. Revelation 5 shows that it was the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. He was worthy to break the seal. You see, he was the revelator. That's what we saw in John in Revelation 1. The revelation originated with the potter, and Christ was the one who, who revealed it. So Christ is the one who is authorized to open the seals. When you get to Revelation 6, we find the Lamb beginning to open the seals, and he opens them one by one. Now, an important key of understanding the book of Revelation is to realize that it is that primarily the book of Revelation runs through in time flow. It is sequential. There are occasional insects. You know, if you read a book, you read a novel, for instance, and it's going along telling a story, every so often you'll have a chapter that sort of goes back and picks up a thread uh, of earlier events and brings you up. You know, if you're talking about several different characters, and the novel will maybe be tracing one particular character through, but every so often you have to stop and go back and sort of pick up the thread and bring, uh, bring it up, because what's going to happen is everything is going to come together at, at the conclusion. The book of Revelation is that way. There, it is basically sequential. Uh, it follows through. The seal was opened. The book was unrolled. Uh, there were events that transpired. Then the next seal was broken, and it was unrolled a little further. And then uh, more events transpired. The next seal was broken and unrolled a little further. So it's basically sequential, though there are a few places that go back and sort of pick up the story and bring you up to, bring you up to the spot. Uh, that is an important key in understanding the book and realizing that it weaves together the Word of God, the testimony of Christ, and the things that John saw. Revelation 6 shows that when he opened the first seal... What he saw was a white horse and a rider. Now, we know that uh, Jesus Christ is pictured as returning on a white horse, described in Revelation chapter 19. We also know, as you go through here, the first four seals, uh, often called the four horsemen, because there were uh, because the first four, when each of the first four seals is open, John sees a rider on a horse. When you go back to Matthew 24, Jesus went through a sequence. He talked about false prophets, and then wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, then famines and disease epidemics. Then he talked about a time when, of, of intense persecution on his people. And then immediately after the tribulation of those days, he talked about the, these great signs in the heavens. When you go down through Revelation 6, you find exactly that sequence. You find the white horse, 
which in reality is not Jesus Christ. It is the first in the sequence is not that Christ comes back first, it's that false prophets coming in his name. Then the red horse the, uh, that had power to take peace from the earth. Then the black horse uh, of famine. Uh, the pale horse of disease and pestilence. The fifth seal is opened. And John sees a vision that reveals to him there will be a yet future martyrdom of saints, an end-time martyrdom of saints. Then when the sixth seal is opened, uh, verse 12, he sees things turn dark and, the, and all these signs in the heavens. If you go through Matthew 24, you can trace it right now. This is the prelude, as it says in verse 17, for the great day of his wrath. God's wrath begins after the sixth seal. The first six seals represent events that come that are precipitated by Satan. Now, understand, if you want to understand where we are in prophecy right now, just hold your spot here, and let's turn back to the book of Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. He said, I don't want you to be worried and upset that, that the end is immediate, that the day is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Verse 3. For that day shall not come, except what? Two things must occur, Paul said, that will set in motion the sequence of end-time events. Except there come a falling away first, except there come an apostasy. Actually, the word translated, the Greek word translated falling away, is the Greek word apostasia. It's the word we get apostasy from. It means a departure from the truth. That day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and, secondly, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, there have been a lot of men of sin. There have been a lot of men who have advocated lawlessness. This is a particular individual who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. An individual who, as we're told, uh, whose coming, verse 9, is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. This is the one whom the Lord shall... This is that wicked one who will be revealed, verse 8, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth destroy with the brightness of his coming. So this is a particular man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who is, who is destined for destruction. That's what son of perdition means, the one who is destined to be destroyed, who is destined to be destroyed by Jesus Christ at his return. An individual who works remarkable miracles at using the power of Satan, signs and lying wonders. Now, in Matthew 24, Jesus talked about false prophets who would work miracles so impressive that, if possible, it would deceive the very elect. Talk about uh, this great uh, false prophet that would do these uh, lying wonders, these uh, miracles that uh, would be very impressive, as it describes, and uh, uh, great signs and wonders, as Christ talked about in Matthew 24, 24. Well, Paul talked about it here uh, in Second Thessalonians 2.8, or, or uh, uh, rather uh, uh, 2.9, uh, these signs, these lying wonders. You can go to Revelation 13 and you read uh, about this uh, false prophet in conjunction with the beast who performs great uh, miraculous signs that impress people all over the earth and cause everyone uh, to give loyalty and allegiance and devotion to the beast. Paul explains here in 2 Thessalonians 2 that the sequence of end-time events occurs. First of all, a, a great apostasy, a, a departure from truth, a falling away must occur. And secondly, that final man of sin will be revealed. Now, the system that would produce that man of sin, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, the mystery of iniquity does already work. The mystery religion of lawlessness was already functioning in Paul's time. It was already functioning in the early 50s A.D. The system out of which that final man of sin would finally come. But there was something restraining. You see, things have to happen at the right time. Now, I have 
trouble believing that the first part of what Paul talked about in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 has already occurred. Uh, we have experienced an apostasy in our days that is about on as large a scale as anything could possibly happen. You know, it's not, uh, I don't know, you can't fall away from the truth unless you're in the truth. See, so the departure from the truth has to apply to people who have the truth. So, on the one hand, has there been a falling away? You know, used to, uh, years ago, you know, some of you remember back in the 70s, you know, some guy would leave and he'd take a handful with him, you know, and if two or three guys left and took two or three handfuls, we thought, oh, no, maybe the great falling away has come, you know. There's three dozen people that have left, or, you know, a hundred people, oh, no. Well, I think we've seen events in the last few years that have so dwarfed any of those things and happened on a scale uh, that none of us even imagined. Even though we'd read the verse, we knew, yeah, there's going to come a falling away, but we didn't expect it to happen in quite the way that it did, did we? At least I, I Maybe you had the scenario all, all figured out. I, uh, I didn't have, it, have all the details figured, filled in in my, my black book. I don't know about you, but uh, uh, from everything I can see, I think that part of the prophecy uh, has happened, and, and at least is in the process. We're still sorting uh, in a period of sorting and sifting. That's, that, that's one aspect. Then, what's going to happen? What is the, the, the thing on the world scene that is going to occur? The rider on a white horse is the first one that rides, isn't he? That's the first seal. The rider on the white horse goes riding out. He has the bow in his hand. The bow is the symbol of Nimrod, the mighty hunter. You know, Jesus Christ, when he returns on a white horse, has the sword of the Spirit coming out of his mouth, the Word of God. That's what he conquers by. This individual goes forward. You see, there is coming on the world scene, and I don't know whether it's going to be the next pope or, or, or what. You know, you, you, you can't... Uh, entirely fill in the, the gaps. You remember uh, when Pope Paul VI died, they elected a new pope. He was John Paul. And he was there for a few months, and boom, just mysteriously. You know, one day turned on the news and he died. Well, that, you know, was sort of curious. Uh, an amazing thing. Here he was gone a matter of a few months, and then you had another one. He's been on the scene for about 20 years. Now, and very, signif very significant events in terms of setting the stages of end-time prophecy have occurred. Now, I don't know how long Pope John Paul uh, II is going to live. No nobody does. Uh, he's obviously uh, getting on up in years, and his health is not good. It's not just that, uh, his age, but uh, he has uh, various uh, serious health problems that uh, uh, are affecting him. How long is he going to stay? Well, I don't know. Is the next individual the man that takes his place? I don't know. You don't know either. But the time is going to come. And I think as we, if, you, if you realize that, that two things are linked in the same verse, you sort of get the idea they will be within proximity of one another, that that man of sin will be revealed. This individual will be made manifest. It will be obvious to those who know the truth. It will be obvious, you see, because how do you spot a false prophet? If he speaks not according to the law and to the testimony, it's because there's no truth in him. He may call fire down from heaven. He may do the most astounding things you've ever seen in your life. In fact, he probably will. Describes that. I mean, it's going to be impressive. The very elect won't be deceived because they know what to look for, and they look for the message. They look for the message. But you see, the white horse rise first. And so we see this sequence of, of seals, and chapter 6 goes through the first six seals. There are only seven seals. Chapter 7 is a stop in the action between the opening of the sixth seal right before the seventh seal. The seventh seal is the day of the Lord, the great day of His wrath. That's described in chapter 8. But chapter 7, after these things, see, after he would seen the sixth seal, after the heavenly signs, after these things, the four angels were standing there ready to, all the action was ready to happen. They said, wait, hold up until we've sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. You see, here are individuals, the sealing of 144,000 is yet future. It doesn't occur until after the events of the day of the Lord. I mean, after the events of the heavenly signs, before the plagues of the day of the Lord. Here are individuals who are going to be protected from God's wrath. Because the wrath of God is poured out on the children of disobedience. Here are individuals who have turned to Him. And they represent you see, uh, a starting point of those who turn to God, who reject 
the beast and his power. John, in Revelation 7, sees two visions. Chapter 7, verse 1, starts the vision of the 144,000. Uh, that is right after the heavenly signs and before the seventh seal is opened. But then, beginning in verse 9, after this he saw something yet future. And as you look on down nine through verses 9 through 17, it's obvious that it's way future. See, it's, it's a contrast between a handful and a great multitude. Between 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes and between this group, uh, this multitude that no one could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues. It's a contrast. You see, the end of the story is what John sees here. It, he sees individuals who've stepped out on faith, who have obeyed God, and now they're going to be protected from God's wrath. But then he looks all the way down and he sees this whole huge multitude stand before the throne. They will not hunger or thirst anymore, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. They, God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Well, you read about those events back in Revelation 21. That's the first, Revelation 21, 4 is when God wipes all tears from their eyes. So the timing, you see, of the latter part of this vision, what John sees is, is the beginning and the end. He sees the starting point, and then he sees the culmination when everyone, he sees the whole family stand before God. Now, chapter 8 goes right on back into the chronological sequence. The seventh seal is open. The seventh seal consists of seven trumpets that are blown, and the trumpets begin to sound on through chapters 8 and 9. And by the time you get down to uh, chapter 9, verse 14, the sixth angel has sounded his trumpet. Now, in chapter 10 and 11 and 12 and 13, John begins to, to pull in other strains of the story. Uh, chapter 10 uh, talks about uh, this little book, and if you want to understand a little bit about the little book, you go back to Ezekiel 2 and 3. Ezekiel had a little book, and it had to do with the warning message to Israel, and, and it was sweet to the taste and bitter in the belly. You can go Ezekiel. See, John is bearing record of the Word of God. You, he just gives you a little bit, but you can go back to Ezekiel, and you can read some more on the story. Chapter 11, uh, he is pictured. Now, we notice here, you're tying together several things. One is Jerusalem is being trodden down of the Gentiles 42 months. Well, you know, Zechariah 14, 1 talks about how all nations come up against Jerusalem to battle. Well, John sees the city of Jerusalem being ruled by the Gentiles for this three and a half year period. At the same time, he sees two witnesses representing uh, God who are there prophesying for this same period of time, 1260 days, three and a half years. And it comes on down through the story of their ministry, and then in, chapter, in uh, verse 15 uh, describes the sounding of the seventh trump. It comes down through this three and a half year period uh, of time of Gentile domination of Jerusalem, a time when the two witnesses are God's representatives there, and now uh, at the conclusion of this three and a half year period is the seventh trump, and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. Now, in chapter 12, John sees a wonder in heaven. He sees a remarkable event and describes the woman here that is the bride of Christ or the, the woman that is, is the church, uh, the Old Testament church, the New Testament church, uh, the Messiah being brought forth. Uh, by the time you get on down to verse 14 of Revelation 12, it talks about this woman being taken into the wilderness to be nourished for a time, times and a half a time, three and a half years. See, the Gentiles have trodden down Jerusalem for 12, three and a half years. Two witnesses are prophesying three and a half years. Now the woman is in the wilderness being nourished in her place for three and a half years. So we, we see what's going on. You see, we're beginning to tie these events together. Chapter 13 goes back and picks up the story of the beast, which you'd have to go back to Daniel 7 to read about. And he sees and describes the, the, uh, the sequence of the beast coming on down and how ultimately this system will cause all to receive a mark. A mark in their hand and their forehead. Well, chapter 14 describes a picture because, remember, uh, the seventh angel has sounded in chapter 11, verse 15. 14.1 shows the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. Mount Zion was the seat of David's palace, of David's government, of the throne of David. Symbolic of here. The Lamb is standing there, and this 144,000 we had seen sealed back in Revelation 7 
What do they have? They have the Father's name written in their forehead. Now, just three verses earlier, we read about those who had the mark of the beast in their forehead, those who had the name of the beast in their forehead. So you've got a huge number of people who have or stamp with the beast. Here we have individuals who had the Father's name. Now, at the time they made that choice, at the time they made that choice, they were making it based on faith. They'd gone through a time of great persecution. It was prior to the time of the uh, wrath of the day of the Lord. And they made a choice based on faith. Now you see the end of the story. You see those who based their life on what they could see, the pressure uh, and the influence of, to conform to the beast system, they are now the recipients of plagues that are poured out. And here are those who are with Christ uh, who had rejected that system and who have the Father's name. Well, it describes this as we come through. Uh, 14 verse 8 has Babylon, the great Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city. So we get the time sequence here. You see, you get, it's Revelation 18 describes in detail about the fall of Babylon, but we're, we're running through the time sequence here in chapter 14. And, uh, 15, uh, shows the, uh, the seventh angel has sounded, and so now, uh, the, uh, Seventh trumpet has sounded, and so now we have seven angels coming out with seven vials to pour out on the earth. And we have this here in chapter 16. Uh, these uh, these uh, final seven last plagues that are poured out that fill up the wrath of God. Now, chapter 17 and 18 describe the judgment of this false system. It is a religious, military, political, and commercial system. Chapter 17 describes primarily the religious aspect and some of the political aspect of this battle in the great. Chapter 18 emphasizes the commercial economic aspect of this system. And the two chapters together describe, they sort of come back, pick up the story earlier on, and bring you down to the point we are in the time flow, which is the destruction of the false system. Chapter 19 uh, describes here uh, the events surrounding the marriage supper, as it is mentioned in Revelation 19.9. And chapter 20 shows the binding of Satan, the ushering in of the thousand-year reign of the Messiah, and culminating with the white throne judgment. And then chapter 21, John sees a new heaven and a new earth, the new Jerusalem coming down. Chapter 22 gives us our final glimpse. And we're told here in Revelation 22:12, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they which do his commandments, that they may have light to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. You see, that is the concluding message for all of us. But he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. This is a book to be read, and as we're, sa- as we're told in the very beginning of the book, blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. You see, John laid out the se- was used of God to lay out the sequence of the story, bringing us on down to the ultimate uh, the, the ultimate culmination of God's plan. Prophecy not only shows God's sovereignty, it holds out a hope to the people of God and enables us to make sense of the world in which we live and to have hope and understanding of the events that are going to culminate in the years ahead of us.